Greetings, friends, fellow Earthlings, and luminaries in the human journey. Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, the Cosmobiologist Lau, and we are brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Seganet.org. As always, we want to thank all of you who are out there watching our show right now live on YouTube and asking questions for our guests in the chat, all of you who tune into our show after the recording is posted on YouTube, and all of you who ask questions using the hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter. This month, we'd like to give a special shout out to Dr. Jim Pass, a longtime viewer of the show, who's also the founder and director of the Astro Sociology Research Institute. Dr. Pass always brings really intriguing questions to our show and for our guests in the realm of sociology and other humanities, which are also a very crucial part of this quest that we all share in better understanding our place in the cosmos. And that's actually kind of fitting with what we're speaking about this month. Uh, this month, we'd like to, we're going to be talking with a guest who has a background, not just in science, but also in theology, as well as history in some other realms. Uh, we titled this episode, Exploring Outer Space and the Inner Self because we have joining us the Reverend Dr. Lucas Mix, who studies life concepts across disciplines and wonders, what is it about life that makes us look for more of it in space? He is the ninth Bloomberg Chair of Astrobiology at the Library of Congress. He holds a doctorate in evolutionary theory, and he works to facilitate science engagement with religious leaders. So welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, Dr. Mix. Oh, wonderful to be here. Yes, I'm so glad you could join us. I'm so glad to finally have you on the show. I've been thinking about you for a very long time and how cool it would be to have you given your background and your expertise. And now that you've been a chair of astrobiology, the Library of Congress, that the timing just felt very right to have you on the show. Um, so before I get, I get started here, kind of going into what you're currently up to and, and some of the things you've been doing in your career, for all of our guests, I always like to ask them about their science origin story, what got them into becoming researchers but with you, I, I want to actually ask, what, what were the trajectories for you in, in not just science, but also theology? Do you have an origin story that kind of culminated to bring you forward to finding this kind of dual career? I do. I, I find this, uh, I love this question just because I get so enthusiastic about the meaning of life uh, and taking that from various angles. So when I was in high school, there was a great genetics program. And that really got me enthused uh, about how I could do biology without making a mess. And I, I really liked this idea of, you know, the mathematical study of biology. And I ended up going to the University of Washington and studying biochemistry and comparative religion at the same time. When I was a junior, I really wanted to go to the NASA Academy um, which is a program for undergraduates. And so I applied to that, and I got this phone call out of the blue from Jerry Soffen, who had been the project scientist for the Viking missions. And he was running outreach at Goddard Space Center, and he said, no, 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 you don't want to do NASA Academy. You want to do a research program. And so he talked me into the uh, director student researcher program at at Goddard Space Flight Center, um, where I was strangely enough doing uh, thermal engineering, um, but uh, it was just this great opportunity to talk with people and get involved. And it happened that that year the Martian meteorite ALH eight four zero zero six was discovered, and well, it was it was discovered in eighty four, but uh, it was announced. Uh, that year that folks at Johnson Space Center thought there was evidence of life in there. So this really new enthusiasm for the question of life on Mars uh, developed right at that time that I was working for NASA, um, and I just got roped right in. Wow, it's such cool timing. So I was in the NASA Academy. It was a wonderful experience, but I never had the, the benefit of meeting Jerry Soffin. Um, you know, he passed away um, back then, fortunately. Um, and we lost him. But I think for those watching, Jerry Salfin was, was such an advocate for young people getting involved in science and space exploration and joining NASA. Uh, we even have a travel grant for young students named after Jerry Salfin that those of us who are in the NASA Academy, re we review the applications for that 
Um, that's very cool. And it's so cool that you also mentioned that kind of that time in history when you were studying then and, and working for NASA in 1996, when, when ALH 84001 was, was kind of announced. I, I was a kid. I remember Bill Clinton coming out on, on, on the lawn of the White House and making this proclamation that we might have just made the biggest discovery of all of humanity. And, and indeed, the, the word astrobiology wasn't really used by NASA until that moment. Before that, we called it exobiology. And then it became astrobiology. Uh, and so I, I love that that kind of was like your birthplace into this whole realm. And so what, what kind of led you then to want to explore not just you know astrobiology, but what's the other side of the coin? Yeah, no. So I, I was really interested in, uh, in the big questions, uh, particularly this, what is life? And so I decided to go someplace for graduate school where I could study, keep studying both. Uh, I went to uh, Harvard, uh, which has a really good uh, theology program. And uh, but I went there for uh, organismic and evolutionary biology. Um, and I had really intended to go into science for a while and be a, a, a professional scientist. But I found about halfway through graduate school that I spent all of my free time talking with scientists about God. And, uh, and so I I really decided that it was important for me to go to seminary as soon as I got my doctorate. I, I wanted to finish. Uh, and I was really a little bit worried about my, my doctoral committee, you know, because they put all this work into me. Um, and how would they feel about me going to seminary? But they were very, very supportive. I, um, I just think we, we're always doing this work of trying to place ourselves in the universe. And that's not just a, a science question. It's also an ethical question and a, a meaning question. And so, uh, you know, how do we do that, that work of putting those things together? And um, that, that led me on to, you know, try and, try and keep both hats on at the same time. I was a college chaplain for a year. I was a college chaplain for four years uh, at the University of Arizona. Uh, and after that, uh, moved on to my current position, which uh, facilitates giving science information to church leaders. Oh, that's fantastic. And I, I absolutely want to come back to the, the Eclis project and what you've been doing there. Um, but first, a, a few things I want to bring out. One, for, for younger people right now um, who want to learn more about astrobiology, there's something really awesome right now in the works. It's the third version of something called the Astrobiology Primer. And the cool thing about the Reverend Dr. Lucas Mix is he was the author of the very first astrobiology primer and the advocate for really bringing this together to have some source of knowledge that kind of allows us to understand many of the diverse topics and disciplines that come into astrobiology. So I, I would just love to hear from you. What was the birth of this idea of building the astrobiology primer? And, and what was that like kind of being the, the progenitor of this really incredible thing <laughs> that we all now in astrobiology have used? Yeah. Um, so, so Graham mentioned that in 96 was when, when astrobiology in its sort of current incarnation came about. It was called exobiology before that. Um, and that came both from, from the Martian meteorite uh, and the first discovery of extrasolar planets. Um, and so we, we started having conferences. And I, I, think it was, um, I think it was in 2000. It might have been 2001. I was a young graduate student. I didn't know any better. And uh, I, I said, you know, we've got these biologists and these chemists and these geologists and astronomers, and they don't all speak the same language. So how do we how do we solve that? Maybe maybe we could just like assign reading to people. Maybe we could say, you know, here's this short document that introduces astrobiology, and if you come to a conference on astrobiology, you can expect people to have read it, and anything that's not in there, then you would have to explain uh, because frequently, you know. For example, the word terrestrial, if you're a biologist, means on land and not in the water. Uh, and if you are an astronomer, uh, it means a rocky planet and not a gaseous planet. Um, so, so how do you see that everyone's using the same language? And I, uh, I mentioned this to Barry Bloomberg, who was the head of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And he said, great, you should write this. And I was just completely overwhelmed. Um, I like to say that... Uh, Six years, 100 contributors, 24 authors, eight editors later, we came out with the first astrobiology primer, a quick and dirty introduction to astrobiology. And um, 
It was a blast. I learned a lot. Uh, we had great communication, entirely written by early career scientists. And it was such a success that we did version two uh, in 2016. And version three is almost out. We're, we're just about to cross the finish line. So that's very exciting. I have, I have handed on to some other folks, um, but I'm looking forward to reading it. Absolutely. Me too. I, I think one thing I commonly will tell early graduate students, especially two of the best things you can do to learn more about the field of astrobiology is to read the astrobiology primer and to go to the astrobiology graduate conference, because those two things will help you to learn what's going on in other disciplines within astrobiology as well. Um, and, and you mentioned Barry Blumberg there, and I'd like to come back because now you've been the ninth Barry Blumberg chair of astrobiology at the Library of Congress. And I, unfortunately, I missed your talk at the recent AbSciCon, but I, I saw you give a talk at the recent SOCIA meeting, which we can talk about in a little bit as well. Um, but it's a really beautiful talk about ascension narratives in science and theology and in fiction writing. I'd love to hear about your work at the Library of Congress and, and how that culminates now and what you're currently working on. Awesome. Everything is connected. I, I feel like, you know, all of these stories tie together. I am. Um, so, so first of all, the, the Bloomberg Chair um, at the Library of Congress is this opportunity to think about the societal implications of astrobiology and a lot of these, these big picture questions that I'm interested in. And I proposed that I would go there and read through Carl Sagan's papers. Um, particularly, he was interested in writing this book called Ethos on Ethics after his book's book on the cosmos. And uh, he never wrote that book, but it just had some amazing insights. And so uh, that was one of, the, one of the reasons I was there. My research has really come together as this discussion about planetary travel and stories we tell about planetary travel. So there's this great quote from Galileo who said, uh, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to tell us how, the he how to go to heaven and not how the heaven goes. And this was Galileo saying that the church should not be involved in astronomy um, and that scripture was doing things other than astronomy. Uh, and those things were the important parts of scripture. It was not knocking scripture, but saying, you know, this is, this is something with profound ethical significance um, and we might focus there. Anyway, I totally agree with Galileo that the church should not be telling astronomers how to do astronomy. But I also think that the way we talk about going to heaven and the way we talk about going to space have always been tied together in our imagination. So I, I traced the history of this, looked at, uh, at science fiction, um, really going back pretty early, but um, you know, some 16th century science fiction all the way through Carl Sagan, who was a great science fiction author, uh, as well as a great astronomer and astrobiologist. And I think for me, the big take home was that we have this idea that there's, there's higher and lower physical space, which is pretty straightforward, and there's higher and lower forms of life. Now, all of us know what that means. We think of ourselves as higher forms of life and other forms of life as lower than us. Um, and then there's this idea of, of higher and lower spiritual. So we talk about Jesus ascending um, or, uh, you know, going up to heaven. Why is it that we talk about as going up to heaven? And historically, we've always, we have generally, at least um, in the West, talked about those all together. Now, as a biologist, I would say, well, higher and lower life really aren't things. In biology, we talk about um the development of an individual who grows up along a, a fixed path set by genes. And we also talk about the evolution of a species, and that doesn't go up, it goes out. So what we want to think about is diversification, which is not always about ascent. Um, and as most of you probably know, uh, Copernicus reminded us that, that we are not near the center of the cosmos, um, that, uh, you know, this up and down in astronomy is relative as well. 
So I, I sort of wanted to unpack what it means when we talk about going up uh, and ascent. And it's probably not biology and it's probably not astronomy most of the time. Uh, when we talk about growing up, uh, it's something ideological or spiritual. And how do we figure out what we're bringing to that discussion in terms of what we think is is going up or growing up um, and, and what that, that means? So should we go to space? I think yes. Uh, I'm a big fan of space travel, and I'm a fan of space exploration. So it's not because space is better than Earth, and it's not that we will leave Earth behind, which I think is a, a very dangerous uh, idea, but it's an idea that when we go into space, we are going out. We are diversifying, discovering strange new worlds uh, and civilizations. And uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. I... Uh, I think we should be very careful because historically this idea that societies evolve towards, you know, some good future, that there is um, uh, a development as a society, it sort of lures us into thinking, well, if I know what a future society should like, look like when it's grown up, then I have an obligation to help it along the way. And that starts getting really dangerous ethically really fast um, in terms of things like eugenics um, and, and some civilizations deciding that they're better than other civilizations. Um, it's generally called white man's burden, uh, this idea that, that we know we're, we're better. So how do we think critically? I am a priest and I do think there is a better, I think there's a right way to go. And I want to be clear that we're not getting that from biology or astronomy. We don't need to get it from Christianity, um, but let's think about where we get it and let's talk together. Uh, you know, do we want to go to space? Why do we want to go to space? What is it up there that we value and what are we leaving behind or not leaving behind? Well, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And there's so much to unpack there. Um, I do want to say for our audience watching right now on YouTube, uh, please keep asking your questions uh, for Lucas. We will get to those as soon as we can. I have my own questions, though, to ask first, and I have a lot of them. Um, I will. Uh, we will have videos eventually from Absicon and Socia of, of Lucas's talks, and so you can learn more about these ideas of ascension narratives uh, in our storytelling. Uh, one thing we want to point out on the NASA Astrobiology Twitter account, at NASA Astrobio, we asked the audience this week, um, how they kind of prefer getting their stories about journeying in the universe and exploring the universe. And we gave them some options like books, movies, and podcasts. Um, others could have included things like video games and things like that, but Twitter limits you a little bit there. Um, interestingly, we got movies was the top response. People like watching film about exploring the universe. Books was a close second, though. So that kind of touches near and dear to my heart since I, I prefer books myself, but we had things like Star, Star Wars in 2001, A Space Odyssey, where some of the films mentioned, uh, many different books were mentioned. I personally mentioned, I love the sci-fi horror video game series called Dead Space, um, which also has its own religious and scientific aspects as well. Um, but a question then for you, uh, Lucas, is what stories have inspired you to want to explore life and explore the universe? Oh, I am a huge fan of science fiction. I am a fan of a genre that's come to be known as speculative fiction. So rather than, than emphasizing the science, it emphasizes what if things were a little bit different. Um, I certainly enjoy Star Trek. Um, there is an author by the name of Ursula K. Le Guin who does amazing stories about life on other planets and how it might be different than life here. I was just rereading a snippet of her book, The Dispossessed, um, which talks all about both the physics of space travel and um, like traveling away from our comfort space. Uh, so i huge fan of that. Uh, recently a fan of uh, Nnedi Okorafor's Binti trilogy, uh, which explores some similar topics. Uh, Sagan is amazing. John Scalzi is amazing. I'll do a quick plug. There is a Space on the Page podcast from the Library of Congress Kluge Center. And I have conversations between astrobiologists and science fiction authors about exactly these topics. Uh, and we have a great time. So uh, check that out if that's interesting. 
That was actually my next note that I wanted to ask about the podcast. There have been six episodes now, uh, uh, three by by the previous Chair of Astrobiology, three by yourself. Is the intention now to have three for every Chair of Astrobiology moving forward? Uh, and what? And also on top of that, what really inspired you to bring together science fiction authors and scientists together in the episodes that you ran? Yeah, um, it, it is our hope that that each new Bloomberg Chair will do three new episodes. Uh, so David Barron's focused on um, books about the exploration of Mars in particular. Uh, and then I had three on science fiction. I sci- Astrobiology has been wonderful for me because it's a group of people willing to ask these big questions. Um, and it's not just about asking the big questions, though I've discovered. It's asking the big questions and then seriously asking what science can tell us that answers those or doesn't answer those. Um, And so it's a group of people that's very open-minded, really interested in learning across different fields. Um, And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to get some of these people, many of whom are are ardent sci-fi fans together with science fiction authors and really talk about this imaginative exploration of the universe that we're all doing together. Oh, that's fantastic. And I love that you brought up big questions. Astrobiology is about big questions. And we humans, we've been asking ourselves not just through science, but through theology and through you know philosophy, these very big questions for a long time. And I'd like to share a personal story um, right now. Uh, when I was young, I went to a Methodist church. Um, I'm no longer part of the church myself, but, but when I was a young person, I went to a Methodist church and uh, pastor Tom Ozenbach was my pastor when I was a, a young child, but he was my family's pastor as well. He was involved in our lives. Everything that I saw, weddings and, and funerals, family gatherings, he was always there. And as I progressed in my life and started exploring more in philosophy and science, uh, I went to college and started studying the sciences. And he knew I was very interested in space exploration. I would interned for NASA and did some of these really cool things. And and so at that point, every time I would I would go home to Pennsylvania uh, to see a wedding or unfortunately a funeral, and Pastor Tom would be there. He always wanted to have conversations with me, and and those are some of the most meaningful moments from my entire life when it comes to big questions and sharing in big questions with people with slightly different viewpoints. Um, for for instance, during my grandfather's uh, funeral when he passed away, which is very hard for me, uh, Pastor Tom and I had a really just very beautiful moment, about maybe an hour long conversation, because he, he saw that I was dealing with a lot of stuff. Um, we got into a conversation about our beliefs and understanding, but then we also started talking about the cosmos and about space. And Pastor Tom always wanted to hear about the best Hubble Space Telescope images and new missions from NASA and when we were going to Europa and Mars and Venus and all of these kinds of things. He wanted to know when those things were going to happen and if I was part of it and what I knew about it. And then he was always trying to, to frame that himself in the conversation with God and Christianity and the Bible and his understanding of the world. And so I, I'd like to kind of, using this story, also transition now to something else that you've been working with, uh, the Eclis Project, uh, equipping Christian leadership in an age of science. I, I'd love to hear more about the project in general and as well as your role in this project. Yeah, well, we did some some sociological research um I think up to 10 years ago now, and asked people where they got their science information from um, and who they talked to about science. And a lot of them, like Graham, talked to their pastor about it. Um, and Eclis was one of these projects, um, Equipping Christian Leadership in an Age of Science, uh, is the program in the United Kingdom, that really works at how do we get science information to church leaders. Um, and more than that, how do we get them to really think critically about engaging? Like, how do the pieces get put together? So Eclis in particular, we do co- conferences for senior leaders. We get uh, science information to them. We have uh, grant programs for congregations and for seminaries. Um, but we also do research uh, and a little bit of policy advising uh, on science religion topics. I, uh, I have come to believe myself, that all of us do the work of interpreting our place in the universe. Like all of us ask questions of science. It's only a question. It's only a matter of whether we do that well. You know, how do we engage with experts? How do we think critically about the physical world? 
And I think the same is true about ethics and worldview and meaning. Everyone is doing these theological things. Um, you know, maybe it's not theologically, uh, you know, maybe we wouldn't use that word if you're not a theist, um, but everyone wants to know how they fit into the world. And so if all of us are doing all of this work together, how do we have conversations together about doing it well? So I really do think all of us are doing science. All of us are doing theology. Um, but let's let's think about doing it collectively, critically, um, and and bring the best of ourselves to it. Uh, so I'm I'm really passionate about this and and getting particularly the people who have devoted their lives to um, a particular pursuit. Um, how do they have those conversations with others uh, and start putting all the pieces together? That's so powerful. And I feel like so many people focus so much on, on the tools of division and not so much on the tools that really can help us come together. And I, and I love that, that quote you just said there of all of us are trying to interpret, you know, our understanding of our place in the universe. That's, that's really important, this interpretation, because we all come to it from our, our own background, our own experiences, our own personal lens. And we all have so many differences, but there's so much to share, so much to work on together. Um, we have a few more things we want to talk about with you. For the audience, I promise I will get to the Q&A and your questions for Lucas very, very soon. Um, one more thing, uh, actually two more things before I go into a new segment we're going to introduce for the show. Um, first off, I, I mentioned earlier uh, that I, I heard you give a talk on Ascension Narratives at the meeting of SOCIA. Uh, that's the Society for Social and Conceptual Issues in Astrobiology. Uh, you are one of the founding members and someone who's been part of SOCIA for some time. Um, I'd love it if you could just explain to our audience, as some of whom might want to take part in SOCIA in the future, about the organization and what future meetings will look like. Yeah. So astrobiology has always been good at being interdisciplinary, and there are some of us who don't just do natural sciences and do that. Um, but it's sort of hard in the science conferences to get time for those those big questions and those um, things like theology and philosophy and ethics. So we started this group uh, called SOCIA, uh, and it's specifically focused on social and conceptual issues related to astrobiology. Uh, we try and meet uh, every other year, um, and so we have an academic conference. But I think if you, if you Google SOCIA, S-S-O-C-I-A, um, it should pop up, um, and you can learn more about all of the cool people and events that we have. Awesome. Yeah, I was really happy to attend myself. I, I gave a talk in the realm of astrobotany and a current project I have and the ethics of growing plants in Mars regolith with the artist Lucia Monge, um, which you know, I really enjoyed all of the talks at the conference. It was a really fun meeting and a, and a good group of people to join. Um, Lucas, before I get to a new segment we're going to try, I have one more thing. Um, I myself have been training in the martial arts since I was five years old. I've traveled to Korea to train. Uh, I've learned different kinds of styles, Tang Sudo, Taekwondo, uh, Okinawan weapons, all kinds of things. And I, I think a lot of us in the sciences and their various realms of academia are also martial artists. And I understand that you're a martial artist as well. Uh, I'd love to hear you talk about what uh, martial arts training has done for you in your life, what it means for you, what styles you train in, and anything around that realm as well. Yeah. I, um, martial arts is the family business. And I started when I was seven years old. So I usually tell people, it's hard to say what impact it's had on my life because I don't remember life without martial arts. I started in Taekwondo, which is a, a Korean style that focuses on kicks and punches. I transitioned to Hapkido, which is a Korean style. And it's a little bit more broad, does joint locks and grappling and throws. Um, I am just, well, once again, for me, it's all about negotiating your way in the universe. Um, and, uh, and Hapkido has given me some very concrete tools for like understanding how I fit. Um, and uh, it's nice to have practical demonstrations, you know, I, particularly as an academic, there's lots of, of, of abstract questions. And, you know, when, when someone throws you or when you pick up and throw someone, like that's a very practical activity. Um, and, uh, much to many people's surprise, uh, if someone knows how to throw you, it's very fun to be thrown, um, as long as you know how to land properly. Um, but we make sure you learn that first. Uh, also a big fan of, of Tai Chi. 
Uh, I have been teaching Hapkido and Tai Chi, oh, for 30 years now. Um, but if you want to know more, Enso Center for International Arts uh, in Redmond, uh, we have some great Hapkido programs. I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to go plug your, your martial arts school. Um, yeah, for me and myself, you know, training the martial arts, it, it was my first you know, way of learning about meditation and, and meditation practices, learning about external and internal martial arts and experiential learning using your body and space. And, and yes, falling and learning how to fall well is very helpful. It's helped me in my own life in mountain biking or snowboarding, knowing how to fall well is also very important to protect our lives too. Um, so I'd love to transition now to a new segment we want to try out. You're our, you're our guinea pig, our, our first test subject for this new segment. It's a rapid fire question segment. And so if you can, try to keep your answers to like 30 to 60 seconds. If possible, we have a few questions we'd like to ask uh, just so our audience has a better kind of understanding of you and your take on astrobiology and some, some other topics. Uh, so first and foremost, what is your favorite answer to Fermi's question, where are they? I don't think the quote unquote Fermi paradox is a paradox. Um, we don't know and we're looking and I think they are going to be different than what we expect and we haven't seen them because we don't yet know what we're looking for. So how do we look more open-mindedly and more critically at the same time? Mm, very good. If you could go back in time and give your earlier self some advice at the start of your career, what advice would you give? Don't worry so much. That's a pretty good answer. Nice and short. Um, so if there is alien life out there, do you think we'll find it first in our solar system? Or do you think we'll find it first on an exoplanet? Ooh. I try to keep an open mind on that. I don't, I don't want to commit. Mm, okay. I love it. You know, now I, was, I guess there's also the option of, of neither. It could be out in space somewhere. Um, what's something that really excites you about the future? I am really excited about all sorts of things. I think artificial intelligence is a great way to meet things that are not quite like us, but sort of like us. I think that uh, bioengineering and gene editing um, while they are scary, are also just a whole new way of understanding how we fit. Uh, and of course, astrobiology. Uh, I remember very clearly the first astrobiology primer. We had this great little diagram that had a dot for every planet that we had discovered. Um, and there's so many extrasolar planets now that they won't all fit on the page. And that's a that's a great problem to have. We can we can start. Uh, asking new sorts of questions. So there's just all of these amazing things out there. Um, and there are all sorts of amazing things in there. Why, you know, it's a wonderful life if you can explore and discover. Fantastic. What would you say is the best part of your job? Talking to people about what they think is real. Mm, I love that. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, it's a very fun one for me, too. Um, so here, here's the fun one. What is the most unbelievable science fact that you know? I think off the top of my head would be there is a species of bacterium, Dinococcus ratadurans, um, which thrives in high levels of radiation uh, that would basically melt us. And this was probably an adaptation to dryness, not radioactivity. But the idea that life responds with these amazing adaptations and does things we would never imagine uh, just blows me away. I love that so much. Yeah, so I love Dinococcus radiodurans too for its name. Uh, Dinococcus literally means terrible berry. Uh, just like dinosaur meant, meant terrible lizard, Dinococcus is a terrible berry. And I find that pretty funny since it withstands so much radiation. It's pretty cool. Um, so thank you so much for your conversation with me. But now I'm going to open it up for our audience who are watching on YouTube if they have any specific questions for you as well. Uh, the first one I want to ask actually comes to us from Twitter, though, uh, from our ambassador of this month, Dr. Jim Pass. Uh, he's at Astrosociology on Twitter. 
Uh, and like I said, when I started the episode, uh, Dr. Pass almost always has really just wonderful questions about how we how we can connect what we're doing in astrobiology science to astrobiology sociology and the humanities. Um, so from Dr. Pass, when it comes to space education and research, multidisciplinary is too often restricted to the natural and physical sciences. How do religious studies and more broadly other social sciences and humanities currently contribute, in your view, and how should these contributions be expanded? Yes. Um, the 2015 strategy docu document from NASA Astrobiology, in fact, has an appendix uh, that I was one of the authors on uh, that addresses exactly that question in detail. But um, I think, well, for me, the biggest one is we use this, we throw this word life around a lot. Um, and there's a lot of reflection in theology um, and sociology and philosophy about what we mean when we say life. Um, and different people mean different things. So I think one of the th one area we can explore with um, with people in the social sciences and the humanities is is what we're looking for in terms of life. I think this question of standard of standards of evidence is very important. Like what does it take to convince us of something? I think, why we care is deeply important. I think the social structures we use to ask these questions are really important. And that's an area where science and religion have interesting and very diverse ways to contribute because they tend to be structured socially very differently. Both of them, unfortunately, have some dangerous built-in biases. Um, and so being able to do theology and science at the same time gives us an opportunity to unpack those biases in a really powerful way. Oh, I love that so much. And that, that leads so well into our next question as well, um, which I'm, I'm, I, I thought we would get this question. And so I'm, I'm glad we did. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, so on YouTube, user Luis Miguel Rodriguez has asked, how can we manage to reconcile a faith in God with the sciences? And I, I imagine that, that Luis is speaking primarily to the fact that there is some division amongst people who think that you can't you can't believe in the sciences or understand things from the sciences and have a faith in, in God and the Abrahamic religions. Um, I think we focus so much on division. So I, I'd love to hear your take on on bringing together both faith and understanding of science. Yeah, part of it is a matter of perspective. Those of us, uh, particularly in the Anglican Church, have never seen this as a as a big issue. Um, the founders of modern science were Anglican, uh, Newton and Bank Bacon. Um, Galileo, likewise, was was a devout Roman Catholic. And I think the challenge is not one of science per se, but one of theology and how we come to have our how we how we come to know what we know um, and think what we think and how we reason with others. And so uh, the challenge, and I do think it is, it is right and good that religious people have beliefs, and I don't think that those need to be justified by science. I do think that science is a wonderful opportunity, and so my, my theological convictions are that we should respect some, uh, we should respect the, the science when it is done well. Um, and I think most... Christians would agree with that, but what it means to do it well is a really tough social question. So I like to encourage people to think through how do we do that work together? How do we respect what we observe through empirical reasoning um, and peer review and all of these good scientific things? Um, and how do we take seriously the impact that has on our lives and our view of ourselves uh, and our view of our relationship with God. So I think it's a, an opportunity. Mm. That's a, nice, a nice, beautiful answer. I'd like to actually go to another question then um, from Arunava Padar, who's also an intern with my company this summer uh, in the Young Scientist Program at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Uh, Arunava, also then kind of following on to that, wants to know if, if you can answer or, or if there are questions that might directly conflict in theology with space exploration. Um, so kind of going on top of that then, I know that there are some people, for instance, who are opposed to having humans go to space or, or go explore Mars. 
are there conflicts that you see in theology versus space exploration? I think there are many different theologies. I do not, my, my own theology does not, does not give me a conflict, but that doesn't mean that others might not. One of the big questions we can ask is Christians and uh, as well as Jews and Muslims believe that God gave us responsibility for the earth and the things in it. So it matters whether you think that the earth is just the ground beneath our feet. And if Martian ground were the ground beneath our feet, we'd be responsible for that too. Or if earth is a planet, in which case God sort of wanted us to be here. So does God want, does God ask us to be responsible for this place, earth, or does God ask us to be responsible for the universe? Some have argued that theologically we have an obligation for space travel because being created in the image and likeness of God, only we can represent God to other species or other planets. Uh, that might be going a little far for me. Um, I, I'm open to God working different ways in different places, but I, I think that it is important theologically or philosophically, if, you, if you're not inclined towards uh, religion per se, to ask this question of, of what are our obligations on earth and what are our obligations beyond earth and do we have to meet our earth obligations before we go elsewhere um you know your parents probably told you that you should like clean your room before you go out and play and uh i i think that's probably a good principle um on the other hand space travel gives us tools for cleaning up our planet in new and creative ways so i don't think there's an easy answer i think that we have to seriously talk about what scripture tells us, how our relationship with God impacts our relationship with the world and vice versa, and work through that. And most critically, I think I I honestly don't trust myself to do it by myself. And I, I got that from science, um, although many of my, my Calvinist friends got that from their Christianity. Uh, I don't trust myself to reason by myself. I still reason for myself, but I need these communities to help me work through all of the implications and, and call me when I'm being silly. So powerful. Erin Nava, who asked that question, is one of our interns I mentioned this summer. In the program, the Young Scientist program, he and our, our other interns, there are 66 of them this summer, will all be taking part in a module where they'll explore moral philosophy and, and ethics and ethical frameworks that we've used to ask just those kinds of questions. What do we owe each other? How ought we to treat each other? And how, how ought we to treat the earth and space? And so, you know, it's really important and powerful that we consider when we're, we're doing science and doing anything, um, the ethical questions that come into the things that we do in this world. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to jump back to another question from Luis Miguel Rodriguez now. Um, because it's a very fun one for astrobiology in general. Um, and and I, I want, I'm curious to see which way, which direction you take it. Uh, Luis's question is, what is the best way of defining life? Oh. I, so first of all, I differentiate between different kinds of life. So there's the life that we share with moss. And that life, for me is best defined by the process of nutrition. We both take stuff that's not us and turn it into us. Um, which, once you start thinking about it philosophically, is very weird. <laughs> uh, why is it when I eat a hamburger, the hamburger becomes me and I don't become the hamburger? Um, there's also a type of life which refers to conscious experience of the world. And... I'm not really sure how to deal with that. It's a it's an I thou question, and I haven't re haven't got a good description yet. Um, there's a type of life which is being able to to oh so so the important thing there is when when people talk about the beginning and end of human life, they're not talking about the beginning and end of nutrition. They're talking about the beginning and end of consciousness. So I think it's important to distinguish between metabolism and consciousness, which are both very important concepts of life. Um, consciousness has something to do with, with personal identity and experience. There's rational life, which is the ability to like know things. 
Um, and honestly, I think that's necessary for empiricism, but can't be tackled within the bounds of empiricism. Um, and so then you need to start talking about minds or souls or something else. Um, I think we have those. I think those are necessary to do good reasoning. Um, and they're just not the type of things we're familiar with in modern language. So we have to be very careful talking about them. Finally, there's spiritual life, which is, uh, you know, to my mind, participation in the life of God. And uh, that's a whole nother type of life that's related to the first three and very important, but also very different. Um, as I said, that's participation, uh, you know, in Christian and Jewish parlance, it, it's breathing. But it's the idea that breathing isn't just moving molecules in and out of your body. It's also sharing that same breath, which is going in and out of everyone else's body and being part of a larger whole. So four different types of life, all of which I think are really important, all of which we're looking for in space. Um, but because it's my area of specialism and because I'm an evolutionary theorist, um, astrobiologists are looking for nutrition. Mm, love it. And there's so many ways for us to explore what it means to be alive, what life is, what consciousness is. Um, for myself, I, I wonder, one of my favorite quotes from the, the Dune uh, series of novels is what senses do we lack that we can't see a universe all around us? I wonder, do, do you think there's anything that we are missing right now as a species, as a biosphere? Do you think there's anything that we're really missing that there might be some bigger hole to the universe that we just can't comprehend yet? I think I'll, I'll use humans as a metaphor, but I think this applies to species as well and, and maybe planets. I don't think God would have made seven, eight billion of us if one of us would have done. Which means that there, there's a unique perspective to every location in the universe. And our goal in life is not to find the best perspective, but to share the perspectives and put them all together. I also think that you can't really know yourself until you know someone else. And so another species particularly sorry like another biosphere um, or uh, another intelligent species would tell us so much about ourselves that we can't see because we're too close to it yeah absolutely it's like comparative planetology it has taught us so much more about our own world and so comparative astrobiology if we had an example two or example three example four of life that really starts giving us some ways of exploring not just you know the science, the, the physical nature of our, our makeup and the matter of the universe, but also other topics in consciousness and understanding um, where we come from. Um, it's, we have it's a question. Not just intellectual. I want to say it's it's emotional and spiritual too. It's it's an encounter with other. Uh, we have a question from Marina Ripan on YouTube. Uh, Marina has said, "What are the things that help unite science and religion?" Uh, how much are both open to each other and how do we help that? It's entirely possible to have a theology that tells you to ignore science. Um, I'm comfortable saying from my perspective, that's a bad theology, um, but you have to make your, your value judgments there. So I think that most of the major world, uh, all of the major world religions definitely have strands within them that say, we have been called upon to know as best we can know, and science is one of the best ways of knowing. I think that that as a Christian, hope, faith, and charity line up very well with curiosity, uh, discovery, uh, and, and engagement. And so for me, science and theology are deeply integrated. Uh, for those of you who are particularly interested, Margaret Osler has a book on the foundations of the philo modern philosophy of science um, and why this was originally a theology discussion. Um, of course they go together because we are all people dealing with the same world and trying to figure it out. Mm, fantastic. Um, we have a question from Rendering Reality 3D Animations, which we're pretty sure is our friend Tom Caruso, a longtime viewer of the show as well. Um and it's, it might be a loaded question. Um, we'll see how you want to answer this. How do we merge an open-minded pursuit of science with a balanced set of morals and a strong faith 
without tainting our pursuit of science. I am very much on the fence on this question. I think that there is an ideal of value-free objectivity in science. And the important thing for me has been the realization that that is an ideal. It will never be perfectly achieved, which means we must always struggle to be better at it. But as a pastor, this is perfectly straightforward for me. The church is inherently messed up because we are our limited created beings. And so theology as well is this ideal enterprise that we want to do well, but we'll only do it well if we constantly recognize that we're not there yet. So I think that science is an ideal. I think the ideals of objectivity and um, impartiality are just so important as long as we don't use them as excuses to think that we're already unbiased. <laughs> And therefore, don't need to work at it anymore. That's when science goes wrong. Mm, intriguing. Um, we have one more question here from uh, one of our production assistants, uh, Anarup Mahanti. Um, Anarup asks, as a Christian with an educational background in evolutionary biology, what do you consider truth if some information is contradictory? Um, so, I, and, and maybe he, he concludes, how do you prioritize truth? Uh, strictly speaking, I prioritize beliefs in which I have strong confidence. So if if we say the word truth, we're already committed to knowing it. And there's a, there's a few things in my in my religious faith that I'll go ahead and say I know. Like I, I know God exists. I know God loves me. I recognize other people don't know those uh, in the way that I do. Um, and that gives me pause. But um, – but most of my beliefs, both in religion and science, are just things in which I have strong confidence. And the question is, how do I assess how much confidence I have? So I'll do a, a quick plug. I have a book called Thinking Fair, Rules for Reason in Science and Religion. Uh, and I break down sort of why I have confidence in some things and why not others and how to measure that and how that lines up with, with a thing called credence, which is how strongly my beliefs affect my behavior and how we get the strength of our belief to match the strength of our confidence uh, is a very tough question. That's very powerful. I, I don't know if we had a link to plug for the book, but we'll definitely find that for after the episode to share with our audience as well. Um, so just a few more minutes here um, for myself. So, so, you know, this is something obviously, you know, our viewers are very intrigued by, by maybe science versus religion, science and religion and, kind of these comparisons, if you could moderate a conversation with any luminaries, any scholars from any time in human history to have this conversation of, of how we how we build forward in religion and science and understanding, what kinds of people or who maybe would you want to bring together to that conversation to moderate you know, the, the, the world conversation of humans um, to help us find the way forward? It's it's politically correct, but I think it's also true. I really want to talk to the people that I haven't heard from. Um, so uh, unfortunately, um, both the science conversation and the theology conversation have been dominated by people in power. And so it'd be very interesting to reach out to the, some of those people who were not allowed to speak for themselves historically. Um, there is a, uh, a theologian by the name of uh, Macrina from ancient Greece, and um, her, her brother wrote a whole lot of very popular theology. Um, so we get a little bit of her, but um, so I, I would like to get, get some of those voices. I think I would be really interested in this category of science as a modern category. And so figuring out how different people in different places and times have sliced up the world differently uh, is really important to me. And I'm, I'm hoping uh, those of you in the audience can hope with me to get a grant that will allow us to do uh, some international dialogue uh, and see how different cultures address the science religion question. 
That's fantastic. I mean, we had natural history and natural philosophy, and then we had, you know, science kind of being born, and then we had science being cut down itself into smaller disciplines and sub-disciplines and sub-sub-disciplines. And it's one thing I love in astrobiology is it brings things kind of back together. And I feel like right now we're at this place where a lot of us are, are recognizing the need to bring things back together and try to start having a, a wider worldview in science, in theology, in philosophy, in spirituality, and other realms. Um, so I, I love that so much. Um, I think we are going to end our episode here in one moment. Uh, if there is any single message you would like to share with younger people or people of the world who want to pursue astrobiology from both science as well as theology or other realms, what, what, what message would you share with them? Don't stop asking questions. Fantastic. Reverend Dr. Lucas Mix, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Joy to be here. <laughs> and for all of our, our guests watching right now on YouTube or watching the recording later on, uh, it's a pleasure having all of you join us as always. You can always reach out and ask us questions using the hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter. You can find me at Cosmobiologist. Uh, you can find us at Sagan Org, as well as at NASA Astrobio. Um, and always you can ask questions in the chat as well in the, in the comments section on YouTube videos. I'm always checking those out and trying my best to respond as soon as I can. Uh, so for all of you joining out there, uh, for Dr. Reverend Lucas Mix for joining us, uh, thank you so much. And until next time, stay curious. <laughs>